Good morning, philosophers. Let us pick back up with, oh, it did it again, XLI, which I think is, should be LXI? 61. <laughs> All right, here we go. Oh, I didn't do a reading yesterday, and, I'm, and I wanted to mention why. Um, because when I woke up, I made the mistake of checking other things. I usually stay away from my devices until I've done my think time, but um, I saw the video from Ross Ulbricht, and, and uh, just it took over my brain, and I had to publish that video for you guys. So that's what I ended up doing yesterday. I think it was worth it. Okay, letter 61. You are doing the finest possible thing and acting in your best interests if, as you say in your letter, you are persevering in your efforts to acquire a sound understanding. This is something it is foolish to pray for when you can win it from your own self. There is no need to raise our hands to heaven. There is no need to implore the temple warden to allow us close to, close to the ear of some graven image, as though this increased the chances of our being heard. God is near you, is with you, is inside you. Yes, Lucilius, there, are res there resides within us a divine spirit, which guards us and watches us in the evil and the good we do. As we treat him, so will he treat us. No man, indeed, is good without God. Is anyone capable of rising above fortune unless he has help from, the, from God? He it is that prompts us to noble and exalted endeavors in each and every good man. Quote, a God, what God we are uncertain, dwells. If you have ever come on a dense wood of ancient trees that have risen to an exceptional height, shutting out all sight of the sky with one thick screen of branches upon another, the loftiness of the forest, the seclusion of the spot, your sense of wonderment at finding so deep and unbroken a gloom out of doors, will persuade you of the presence of a deity. Any cave in which the rocks have been eroded deep into the mountain resting on it, its hollowing out into a cavern of impressive extent not produced by the labors of men, but the result of processes of nature, will strike into your soul some kind of inkling of the divine. We venerate the sources of important streams. Places where a mighty river bursts suddenly from hiding are provided with altars. Hot springs are objects of worship. The darkness of unfathomable depth of pools has made their waters sacred. And if you come across a man who is never alarmed by dangers, never affected by cravings, happy in adversity, calm in the midst of a storm, viewing mankind from a higher level and the gods from their own, is it not likely that a feeling will find its way into you of veneration for him? Is it not likely that you will say to yourself, here is a thing which is too great, too sublime for anyone to regard it as being in the same sort of category as that puny body it inhabits. Into that body there has descended a divine power, the soul that is elevated and well regulated, that passes through any experience as if it counted for comparatively little, that smiles at all the things we fear or pray for, is impelled by a force that comes from heaven. A thing of that soul's height cannot stand without the prop of a deity. Hence, the greater part of it is situated where it descends from, in the same way as the sun's rays touch the earth, but are really situated at the point from which they emanate. A soul possessed of greatness and holiness, which has been sent down into this world in order that we may gain a nearer knowledge of the divine, associates with us, certainly, but never loses contact with its source. On that source it depends, that is the direction in which its eyes turn and the direction it strives to climb in, the manner in which it takes part in our affairs is that of a superior being. What then is this soul? Something which has a luster that is due to no quality other than its own. Could anything be more stupid than to praise a person for something that is not his? Or more crazy than admiring things which in a single moment can be transferred to another? Is it not a golden bit that makes one horse superior to others? Sending a lion into the arena with his mane gilded, tired by the handling he has been given in the process of being forced to submit to this embellishment, is a very different thing from sending in a wild one with his spirit unbroken. Bold in attack, as nature meant him to be, in all his unkempt beauty, 
a beast whose glory it is that none can look on him without fear. He stands higher in people's eyes than the other docile, gold-leaf-coated creature. No one should feel pride in anything that is not his own. We praise a vine if it loads its branches with fruit and bends its very props to the ground with the weight it carries. Would anyone prefer the famous vine that had gold grapes and leaves hanging on it? Fruitfulness is the vine's peculiar virtue. So too, in man, praise is due only to what is his very own. Suppose he has a beautiful home and a handsome collection of servants, a lot of land under cultivation, and a lot of money out at interest. Not one of these things can be said. Can be said to be in him. They are just things around him. Praise in him what can neither be given nor statched, snatched away. What is peculiarly, I think, pecu- I think that word specifically out of the entire human la- English language <laughs> is my kryptonite. <laughs> peculiarly I when I do audiobooks that word destroys me every time praise in him what neither can be given nor snatched away what is peculiarly a man's <laughs> you ask what this is it is his spirit and the perfection of his reason in that spirit for man is a rational animal man's <laughs> Man's ideal state is realized when he has fulfilled the purpose for which he was born. And what is it that reason demands of him? Something very easy, that he live in accordance with his own nature. Yet, this is turned into something difficult by the madness that is universal among men. We push one another into vices. And how can people be called back to spiritual well-being when no one is trying to hold them back and the crowd is urging them on? You know what, this kind of talk of admiring natural wonders, it reminds me of like, you know the sci-fi movies where an obelisk from an advanced alien culture is dropped on a planet with some lower monkey life forms, and the monkeys gather around the obelisk and they're, you know, they're just fascinated by this wonder, Um, and you know, they grow to assume that it's proof of God and they worship the obelisk and stuff like that. This is kind of the same thing that we're talking about here. Like when we see something that has natural beauty in it, um, it's, it's a very sort of like lower life form, unevolved monkey thing to do to sort of gather around it and claim that that's proof of God. The other thing is the line, could anything be more stupid than to praise a person for something that is not his? Well, he's attributing a lot of really important qualities to God instead of the person. Like if you meet someone, what does it say? And if you come across a man who is never alarmed by dangers, never affected by cravings, happy in adversity, calm in the midst of a storm, viewing mankind from a higher level. Um... To say that all of that is not the man's, that person's, it's not that person's fault, it's not the refinement that he worked on in himself, it's it's just the spirit, it's just God, it's not his, so you know, you shouldn't brag about that man, or be impressed by that man. What a robbery of, of rightful virtue, <laughs> like, the guy's worked really hard to attain those qualities in his life, and you just disregard them. Like, we spend a lot of time working on ourselves to achieve these qualities. And and if we achieve them, to whatever degree we do achieve them, like, that's something to be praised and admired and respected, not disregarded, because all of the best traits are not ours. We just get those from an outside source. Yeah, so definitely disagree with those things in that, in that reading. All right, letter 66. The book you promised me has come. I was intending to read it at my convenience, and I opened it on arrival without meaning to do any more than just get an idea of its contents. The next thing I knew, the book itself had charmed me into a deeper reading of it there and then. How lucid its style is, you may gather from the fact that I found the work light reading. Although at first glance might well convey the impression that the writer was someone like Livy or Epicurus, its bulk being rather unlike you or me. 
It was so enjoyable, though, that I found myself held and drawn on until I ended up having read it right through to the end without a break. All the time the sunshine was inviting me. All the time the sunshine was inviting me out, hunger prompting me to eat, the weather threatening to break, but I gulped it all down in one sitting. It was a joy, not just a pleasure to read it. There was so much talent and spirit about it, I'd have said forcefulness too, if it had been written on a quieter plane now and then, and periodically raised on to a higher one. As it was, there was no such forcefulness, but instead there was a sustained evenness of style. The writing was pure and virile, and yet not lacking in that occasional entertaining touch, that bit of light relief at the appropriate moment. The quality of nobility and sublimity you have, I want you to keep it and to carry on just the way you're doing. Your subject also contributed to the result, which is a reason why you should always select a fertile one, one that will engage the mind's attention and stimulate it. But I'll write and say more about the book when I've gone over it again. At the moment, my judgment isn't really a sufficiently settled one. It's as if I'd heard it all rather than read it. You must let me go into it thoroughly, too. You needn't be apprehensive. You'll hear nothing but the truth. How fortunate you are in possessing nothing capable of inducing anyone to tell you a lie over a distance as great as the one that separates us. Except that even in these circumstances, when all reason for it is removed, we still find a habit, a reason for telling lies. All right. I hesitate to start this next one because it's longer. But let's see what happens. Letter 67. I'm glad to hear from these people who've been visiting you that you live on friendly terms with your slaves. <laughs> it is just what one expects of an enlightened, cultivated person like yourself. Quote, they're slaves, people say. No, they're human beings. They're slaves, but they share the same roof as ourselves. They're slaves. No, they're friends, humble friends. They're slaves. Strictly speaking, they're our fellow slaves if you want to reflect that fortune has as much power over us as over them. This is why I laugh at those people who think it degrading for a man to eat with his slave. Why do they think it degrading? Only because the most arrogant of conventions has decreed that the master of the house be surrounded at his dinner by a crowd of slaves who have to stand around while he eats more than he can hold loading an already distended belly in his monstrous greed until it proves incapable of any longer of performing the function of a belly, at which point he expends more effort in vomiting everything up that he did and forcing it down. And all this time the poor slaves are forbidden to move their lips to speak, let alone to eat. The slightest murmur is checked with a stick. Not even accidental sounds like a cough or a sneeze or a hiccup are let off a beating. All night long they go on standing about dumb and hungry, paying grievously for any interruption. The result is that slaves who cannot talk before his face talk about him behind his back. The slaves of former days, however, whose mouths were not sealed up like his, who were able to make conversation not only in the presence of their master but actually with him, were ready to bear their necks to the executioner for him, to divert on to themselves any danger that threatened him. They talked at dinner, but under torture they kept their mouths shut. It is just this high-handed treatment which is responsible for the frequently heard saying, you've as many enemies as you've slaves. They are not our enemies when we acquire them. We make them so. Good Lord. Yeah, an enlightened, cultivated person is a nice slave owner. Good Lord. For the moment, I pass over other instances of our harsh and inhuman behavior, the way we abuse them as if they were beasts of burden instead of human beings, the way, for example, from time to time we take our places on the dinner couches, one of them mops up the spittle and another stationed at the foot of the couch collects up the leavings of the drunken dinners. Another carves the costly game birds, slicing off choice pieces from the breast and rump with the unerring strokes of a trained hand. Unhappy man, to exist for the one and only purpose of carving a fat bird in the proper style. 
although the person who learns the technique from sheer necessity is not quite so much to be pitied as the person who gives demonstrations of it for pleasure's sake. Another, the one who serves the wine, is got up like a girl and engaged in a struggle with his years. He cannot get away from his boyhood, but is dragged back to it all the time. Although he already has the figure of a soldier, he is kept free of hair by having it rubbed away or pulled out by the roots. His sleepless night is divided between his master's drunkenness and sexual pleasures. Boy at the table, man in the bedroom. Good lord. Another who has the privilege of rating each guest's character has to go on standing where he is, poor fellow, and watch to see whose powers of flattery and absence of restraint in appetite or speech are to secure them an invitation for the following day. Add to these the caterers, with their highly developed knowledge of their master's palate, the men who know the flavors that will sharpen his appetite, know what will appeal to his eyes, what novelties can tempt his stomach, when it is becoming queasy, what dishes he will push aside with the eventual coming of sheer satiety. Satiety. Satiety? Hmm. What he will have a craving for on that particular day. These are the people to whom a master cannot tolerate the thought of taking his dinner, assuming that to sit down at the same table with one of his slaves would seriously impair his dignity. The very idea, he says. Yet have a look at the number of masters he has from the ranks of these very slaves. Take Callistus's one-time master. I saw him once actually standing, waiting at Callistus's door, and refused admission while others were going inside. The very master who had attached a price ticket to the man and put him up for sale along with other rejects from his household staff. There's a slave who has paid his master back, one who was pushed into the first lot too, the batch on which the auctioneer is merely trying out his voice. Now it was the slave's turn to strike his master off his list, to decide that he's not the sort of person he wants in his house. Callistus' master sold him, yes, and look how much it cost him. a wild ride. We're going to have to leave it there for today. My thought today is uh, now that I've started this new um, job that requires top levels of productivity and organization and being on top of everything and spinning all kinds of plates. The first I remember the first time I, I attempted this type of job um I was sort of intimidated and didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to organize myself properly. All these habits that I've put in place, honestly, most days are too much. They're extra. They're not necessary. They're way more than is needed. That's the best way to say it. I don't need to bullet point a bunch of random menial tasks to really live life and to get, to get it done. But then you enter a, a phase of life like this one. And these habits that are normally way more than is necessary are now perfectly adequate. And so I'm able to step in to a complicated situation with a lot of things that need to be managed and not even break stride. You know, these things just get added to the system that I've already been using. And... Um, and life moves on and everything stays handled. And the thing that I'm thinking about today and appreciative of is that I've done that work. It's sort of like prepping, but for productivity. It's like I, I put in the work. Uh, I trained myself. I created these processes. And now that I need them, they're already there. I'm not caught in a lurch trying to figure out how to be productive and to stay organized and to not forget things. So that's, this, is, this is one of the reasons. It's like when the power goes out and you need to run the generator and that gasoline that you'd been paying to store for years unused is now suddenly gold. It's like, oh, well, that's why I did it. So that when the power goes out, I can run my generator and, and be comfortable. Same thing with the, the productivity habits. Self-improvement habits. Habits. Okay, well, guys, hope you guys have a great day.